Good evening, everybody. My name is Ibrahim Smeh. I am a neurosurgeon from Jordan, and we are transmitting live to our international audience from Amman, Jordan, from the Farah Medical Campus. Uh, the back drop is a picture of the World Academy of Neurosurgery as we assembled in Vienna. Some of the names I will mention, like Osam al Mufti and others, are in the picture. Uh, the topic for tonight is the supracellular meningiomas, and I'm talking about my personal series. Meningiomas, all in all, they are one of the commonest brain tumors neurosurgeon will face. It's something like 18 to 25% of all primary tumors. So meningiomas and pituitary tumors are the commonest. And among these meningiomas, supracellular meningiomas constitute five to 10%. Meningiomas in general are either in the supratentorial compartment or the, in the infratentorial compartment. Commonest is the supratentorial compartment. So cortical, 25%, parasagittal, 19%, Sphenoid wing, 17%, and the olfactory groove, 8%, and the supracellular is 9%. We are talking about this group, the supracellular meningiomas. So what is, what do we mean by supracellular? This is here the olfactory groove here. This is the crestagulae and the cribriform plate. So tumors arising in this area are called olfactory groove meningiomas. But if you look here, the distance between the olfactory groove and this part, which is the planum sphenoidale of the sphenoid bone, is very little. So people mix the origin. So this is the olfactory groove here, planum sphenoidale here, tuberculum cellae here. And when we say supracellular, we include the planum sphenoidale, the tuberculum cellae, and the diaphragma cellae. We don't include the dorsum cellae. Again, looking at it from another perspective, this is the crystal and the cribriform plate. So tumors arising here are called olfactory groove. Immediately here is the planum sphenoidale related to the sphenoid bone. And here is the tuberculum cella, and this is dorsum cella. Again here, dorsum, the tuberculum cella. Here is the diaphragma cella, and here is the optic canal. So according to the point of attachment, we classify these meningiomas into either in the olfactory groove or the planum sphenoidale or the tuberculum cella or the diaphragma cella or dorsum cella. But sometimes the tumor covers more than one area. So you speak about refractory, planum, tuberculum, or planum, tuberculum, or tuberculum, diaphragma cellae, or diaphragma cellae, dorsum cellae, depending on the origin. So these tumors, like this, they are olfactory groove flowing to the supracellular area. This is a true. So, uh, supracellular meningioma because the epicenter of the region is here and that's the planum. This is tuberculum cell meningioma. This is the epicenter. Here it's arising from the diaphragma cell and the dorsum cell. So we have to differentiate between different types of meningiomas. And when I speak about supracellular meningiomas, I exclude all these. These are all my cases but I don't include them in this particular study of supracellular meningiomas. I also exclude the ones arising from the anterior clinoid, like this. These are all my cases. And you can see this is not included in this study. <clears throat> so these are not supracellular meningiomas, although they are reaching to the supracellular meningiomas because they are overflowing from another place. To know about these meningiomas, Dr. Farsakh will tell you more, and I hope by the end of it, 
you'll stop thinking of the minum and jum as, as a benign, nice things. They can be very ugly. So. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Suprasillan minjum histopathology is not really different from other sites. Uh, like we will talk about uh, important points about meningiomas in general. Uh, meningiomas, as you know, is, uh, they are graded into three grades, grade one, grade two, grade three. A grade one, uh, they have uh, th these subtypes, and I will show some pictures of our own series about these subtypes. Uh, this is uh, meningothelial meningioma. You, you see like a cartwheel pattern. Fibroblastic is like intersecting bundles. Uh, angiomatous is the one with the many, many blood vessels. And microcystic uh, is the one with a very, very small, tiny cyst, meningiomas. All these are grade one. They don't have difference in uh, prognosis from one to each other. But it's very important to recognize the pattern because you have to dif differentiate them from higher grade meningioma. For example, microcystic meningioma, you can see uh, there's, there are cysts here and they can look like clear cells. And I have seen some pathologists me misdiagnose microcystic meningioma with grade one to clear cell meningioma, which is grade two, because of the clear cell clearing in the area. He, uh, he thought some pathologists may think that this is a clear cell meningioma. This is metablastic meningioma. This is bone, a very hardy bony tissue. Uh, this is the gross specimens, and you can see it's all bone and cartilage. This is secretory meningioma. You can see this is a highland material secreting from the uh, meningioma. The meningioma grade two, there are three types, either cordoid, clear cell type, or atypical. And I will show you, this is the clear cell type. It may mimic a microcystic for somebody who does not know the difference, like in this one. But BS stain will be positive because it's filled with glycogen, as you could see in here. And uh, they are clear cells, and it is grade, grade two. So it's very important to recognize this entity and differentiate it from grade one. This is, uh, again, epithelial membrane antigen in, my, in clear cell meningioma. You can see only staining the very periphery of the cells because the, there's a clearing of the cytoplasm. And uh, vimentin is positive as usual, but just thrown is somehow positive, it's 100 negative, and key 67 usually is high. And uh, this is grade two, so we expect key 67 to be in the range of about 10%, I'll show you in some of our studies. The criteria for atypical meningioma, either either cordoid or uh, clear cell, uh, but if there is nothing, you can see, count the mitotic fingers, uh, mitotic uh, figures, if they are more than four, or if there are other criteria for indicating chronicity, like increased cell density, small cell areas, uh, prominent nuclei, sheet-like pattern with uh, no specific patterns, ge or geographic necrosis. Brain invasion, uh, it used in the past to be considered as grade three, now it's, co uh, now it's considered grade two and above. And the grade three remains the one that looks like sarcoma or carcinoma. This is a grade two, you can see this is the brain tissue and this is tumor invading the brain tissue. And again, this is, all these by the way are our pictures. This is brain, uh, meningioma and this is brain tissue invaded by the tumor. And this is geographic necrosis in the tumor. This is the tumor and this is all necrotic. Uh, you can see case six, seven usual is very, very high uh, in these tumors, 10% or above. There is atypia. you can see how the cells are atypical and uh, uh, meningioma grade three, uh, you can see papillary or rhabdoid type or anaplastic. And uh, any meningioma with any other subtypes with high perforation index or uh, high uh, extensive brain invasion can be considered uh, grade three. You can see how the rhabdoid type, this is one of our cases, they, they look like uh, rhabdomyosarcoma, but that's why we call them rhabdoid. They have very eosinophilic cytoplasm and the nucleus is eccentric, pushed to the periphery of the uh, tumor cells as in these cases, and there is a barony clear uh, inclusions. Uh, uh, it is uh, formed by uh, intermediate filaments, and you can see it here. And you can see from telling of the growth that it's very cellular and they are atypical. Usually when you do vimentin, they are, uh, vimentin is strong in the barony clear areas. EMA is positive, but K67 is really very high in these uh, high grade meningiomas or grade three. B53 is usually positive in these tumors. 
this is part of other other plastic tumors is many small cell components uh, and this is looks like sarcomatous type component with many mitosis we can see three mitosis in this field uh, in our series uh, this was about two years ago in, in the one that I received, we had 180 meningiomas, a grade one, two thirds of the meningiomas usually grade one, uh, one third uh, is grade two, and very, very small percentage of grade three. And uh, most of the grade one actually is more common in females, but as you go higher in the grades, it becomes more common in males. So sometimes when I want to see what the, in the frozen section, what is the prospect of this uh, the diagnosis in this case? I look at if this female or male, and what is the site? If it is female, most likely meningioma. If it is bad meningioma, it's expected to be males. Uh, uh, this is a uh, poster that we presented. Uh, I presented at Las Vegas in the CAB meeting, indicating how really to, do, to integrate uh, criteria to call from grade one to grade two to grade three. I, we have many criteria, and uh, this is the uh, study. Uh, a tibia, small cell component, necrosis, this in histo histopathology, bone invasion, brain invasion, necrosis, more common in higher grades compared to lower grades. This is very important. I think these two, this one and this one, very important uh, statement. Mitotic figures in grade one is usually very uh, low. Yani, Yadob tooth one, it usually is uh, 0.2 per 10 high power field. It's higher in grade two. Uh, it, it, although they said it is four, um, I, in actual cases, I found it less than this. And I discussed this actually with the Ari Biri, one of the famous neuropathologists in the United States. And he tends to agree that uh, probably you know, we don't have to make it four, because I think four is too high for uh, meningiomas, uh, to call atypical. The grade three, usually, mitotic figures are very obvious. I don't have really to count them. Uh, with difficulty. The case of seven is also very important. We can see in grade one, it's 2.9, in grade two, 6.4, and in grade three, is about 23 percent. So it's, it's very clear that when you go higher in meningiomas, at least in our study, you will see higher case seven. Progesterone usually is lower in higher grades, and other markers usually are increased, uh, like B53, B63, are increased in higher meningioma. So uh, in general, uh, meningioma uh, is really not one disease. It's at least three diseases. And each disease behaves differently according to the histopathology, to the uh, surgical ex extension, and the, to the location. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. So back to the origin of these tumors. They start, as I said, they start in the planum sphenoidale or tuberculum ciliary area. So this is the area, but then they extend. They can go and surround the anterior cerebral artery complexes. They can invade the optic apparatus. They can go into the optic canal. They can go to the brainstem. They can attach themselves to the perforators of the basilar artery. That's why meningiomas are not benign disease as you may think. Again, this is, uh, picture from the book of uh, uh, Osama al-Mifti, Meningiomas. Uh, when I was a, a registrar or resident, I was envious of Osama al-Mifti speaking about his 1,001 meningiomas, the Alfi Layla Layla. Now I'm proud to say I have more than 1,000 meningiomas. So they can invade, this is one of my pictures, this is the meningioma invading the optic apparatus and it's going into the optic canal. So when they go into the optic canal, they can go both sides or one side. So invasion of the optic canal is very important in these tumors. This is a normal optic canal, as you see it in the coronal section. And this is difference in the optic canal because they are invaded by the tumor. So before surgery, you can tell whether your tumor, this tumor is invading the optic canal or not. So don't say, and some people do that, say, oh, I was surprised to see that the tumor was attached to the carotid artery and the optic nerves. So these are pictures of the optic canal involvement. You can see them here, there, and here, there, and there. So no one will excuse you if you don't diagnose optic canal invasion. 
And this is a paper by Said. 23 out of 29 meningiomas he had, they had radiological evidence of optic canal involvement. Again, look at here. This is the optic nerve and this is the tumor going into the optic canal. This is optic canal being opened. So very essential part of the surgery is to open the optic canal. <clears throat> Paper by Osama Mifti, 2010, also showing the tumor into the optic canal and that you need to drill it. And the drilling is a must for a neurosurgeon. I always say that I learned the drill from the our ENT uh, surgeons because they are the best drillers in the world. They can drill anything. So I learned that from them and I learned to drill the optic canal. This is from uh, Landero from Brazil, a friend of mine. This is the tumor and it is going into the optic canal. And here again, this is a paper by uh, Nelham Shaker. Uh, from Seattle in the United States about the planum sinoidale meningiomas and their importance. So he said, let's classify these tumors into three classes. Class one, they don't invade the optic canal nor they invade the vessels. They don't invade the carotid. So this is a class one. Class two, they do invade maybe one optic nerve. Maybe they will surround themselves around one of the vessels but not completely. And class three, they are large and they are invading the vessels and the nerves and they are going into the sinuses. If you want to do surgery as a surgeon, you have to be a good anatomist. If you don't know anatomy, you will be a very lousy neurosurgeon. And alas, we don't teach our residents anatomy. We just teach them to put a screw or to put a shunt, but not anatomy. Anatomy is a must here. If you want to operate in this area, and this is of course the tuberculum cellulae, this is the planum sphenoidale, you will get into these structures. So you need to know that the ophthalmic artery comes from the dorsal aspect of the coronal artery into the optic canal. Again, optic nerve, optic nerve, you look at this carotid artery, and this is the ophthalmic artery. If you damage it, you will blind your patient. If you damage the pituitary, you will cause problems. You have to be aware of the superior hypophysial artery. You have to know the anatomy of the cavernous sinus. You have to know the anterior clinoid process. It's not just simple thing to do, like most of the neurosurgeons in this part of the world do. They just take a little bit of the tumor and they come out sending the patient for radiotherapy. Again, the relationship between the carotid and the basilar, the stereo communicating, the, the oculomotor nerve. And you know, if you damage the, the oculomotor nerve for anybody and they get ptosis for their life with uh, diplopia, you will destroy them. People don't think of this as complications so long the patient is, is alive and walking. And this is a major disaster for any patient. The blood vessels of the optic apparatus are tenacious. Little, little, small uh, arteries coming from the complex, anterior complex, from the carotid, from the severe hypervisual artery. If you damage these, you will damage the optic apparatus. So how, how come that the neurosurgeons do this surgery with the naked eye, without not using the microscope? I, I have no idea. The fancy form ligament, the relationship to the optic nerve, chiasm, and the arteries. The tetric gland in the diaphragma cellulae, the superhypervisual artery, ophthalmic artery. Close up view in the, carotid, in the carotid cave, sending its ophthalmic artery into the optic canal. You will work in this area, so you have to master this anatomy. If you remove the anterior clinoid, you will come to the roof of the cavernous sinus and you will see this area between the uh, upper ring and the lower ring of the carotid artery. Anterior clinoid. It used to be a small piece of bone. Now it is a huge ocean to, to, to swim in. Uh, this is the optic nerve carotid and if you remove that, then you'll be in the roof of the cavernous sinus. So if this is the anterior clinoid, 
if you drill it, you have to know that now this little thing called anterior clinoid is classified into four parts. The tip, where is it? The tip, the head, the neck, and the body. So here you are, the optic nerve, carotid artery, that's when the anterior clinoid has been removed. You are looking at the carotid in the roof of the cavernous sinus, distal ring or upper ring, lower ring, and the cavernous sinus, and the oculomotor nerve. Question, how many neurosurgeons in this part of the world know this anatomy? And they are called neurosurgeons. Neurosurgery here means that you can do a disc or a shunt. That's all. The blood supply of the pituitary glands, if you have visual artery, if you have visual artery as seen through the endoscope, beautiful view through the endoscope. This is cadaveric specimen. This is pituitary glands. This is the stoke, chiasma, and nerves. And you can see the artery and the ophthalmic artery going in. Beautiful piece of anatomy. Again, here you can see the ophthalmic artery here and so on. Beautiful view again of the optic nerve and the carotid artery. This is called medial optical carotid rhesus. This is called lateral optical carotid rhesus. A new anatomy that you are learning. Also, you have to master the vascular supply. I tell you, maybe one in 10,000 neurosurgeon, if there is any this number, who knows this anatomy of the arteries. This is a beautiful picture from Yazargil. How many neurosurgeons read Yazargil? They read this green book thing, and they have no idea what's going on. Yet they operate on people, and they stand in front of patients, and they call themselves a neurosurgeon. This is a must for any resident or a neurosurgeon. You have to master this anatomy of vascular supply. You have to master the anatomy of the perforators, the various types of the anterior communicating complex, the hypothalamic perforators. This is all in Yazargil book and not in the silly green book. I hope Greenberg would listen to me and stop calling his book a textbook. It is not, it is a handbook. Origin of Hubner artery, is it from A1 or A2? Many variations, and you will face these, these results when you do subracellar meningiomas. Surgery, how do you do it? Various types. I love this approach, the bilateral subfrontal approach, and I call it interhemispheric. Even if you go through the sinus, you can close it with this plug of fat. This is a famous paper from Japan. Uh, the terional approach, again, can be used. Optic nerve, nerve chiasm, this is lamina terminalis, the carotid artery, A1, and M1, this is P2, and the posterior communicating. So you will face this anatomy. <coughs> frontobasal, and I prefer this terminology, frontobasal interhemispheric approach, because that's what it is. You can really take it down completely. This is from my friend, Fred Gentili in Toronto, Canada. And from Michael McDermott in uh, San Francisco. He used this, he used the endocyanine green that he used for the aneurysm surgery to see the blood vessels of the nerve before surgery and after surgery. So this is the tumor before, this is the tumor after, and you have preserved the blood vessels. It is not that you put a finger and take the tumor out. This is obsolete surgery. This is surgery belonging to the Middle Ages, yet it is still practiced in this part of the world. Crimes, I call it crimes. These are true crimes carried out in this country, in this part of the world. Somebody going for this through endoscope and just taking the tumor from inside, leaving the shell of the tumor as it is. This is a crime against humanity, and it has been done. My duty is to expose it. Another crime, a patient with olfactory groove meningioma going to the supracellular area. The silly surgeon, the mediocre surgeon, the speedy Gonzalez surgeon, took this part of the tumor, which is the easiest part. I went out, this is a true story, Jordanian neurosurgeon. Went down to the family and said, I was surprised 
to find the tumor was attached to the vessels. Of course, here there are no vessels the tumor is attached to. And I had to leave the tumor because I believe in God. I did not do damage to the patient. And mind you, don't allow any neurosurgeon to touch your patient because he will kill the patient. This patient came to me and we removed the tumor in spite of all this nonsense. Another crime. And this is in Amman. Surgeon went in, took this part of the tumor. Again, he lied to the family. I was surprised to find the tumor was attached to the vessels. So I stopped because I know God. I'm a good Muslim. So I did not damage the patient. Don't allow anybody to touch the patient. This is another crime. She came our way. In spite of redo, we removed the tumor completely. Endoscopy. It has a very good uh, value, endoscopy. This is the, the picture through the endoscope. You remove the bone, you come to the optic uh, chiasm, you will remove the tumor, and you will see the beautiful anatomy from below. Page paper from Turkey about this uh, approach used to remove these tumors. Another paper from USA from Theodore Schwartz and Vijay Anand. This is ENT surgeon, this is a neurosurgeon making a very good team, as we do with Dr. Mahmoud Asad here. As ENT, we make a good team, and they remove these tumors. Another paper from USA, endoscopic. But look at these cases they do. They are not giant, they are in the midline. So this is good for endoscopy, but what if it is large and going both sides. It is not good for endoscopy. Another paper by Theodore Schwartz and Vijayan Nand. Again, their cases are small ones, not giant ones. Theodore Schwartz and Vijayan Nand again with this tumor. You may say this is large, but I say there is no lateral extension, so you can remove it. And the question always, did they remove the tumor from the optic canal? Can they remove the tumor from the optic canal from below? I doubt it. Strongly, not me, all the neurosurgeons in the world would tell you that it is impossibility that one can remove the tumor from the optic canal from below. And meningioma surgery is Simpson grade one. Paul Gardner and his associates from Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, again, tumors are not large, so this is permissible in endoscopy. Uh, Ricardo Caro, again, this paper, look at these cases. They are very good for endoscopy, small cases, small and midline. Uh, from Canada, the same thing. But look at this. They were honest to report a complication, bilateral caudate nucleus infarcts, because they did not see the blood supply of this lesion. And this famous paper by the group of uh, Amin Kassam and Gardner, uh, removing the tumor and look at the cases again they are small midline cases so endoscopy is good for small midline tumors microscopic surgery is good for the larger tumor so i'll talk to you about my personal series <coughs> please sure yes Yes. Uh, yeah, maybe after some time, they can do what is now, they can't, they will be over because they will have experience. It's important because most of the neurosurgeons, they know the anatomy from above. Sure. And when they go from below, it's a little bit different. It's a, like a, a, I cannot like I cannot agree more with you, Mahmoud. Okay. Endoscopy is the future of a neurosurgery. Thanks. And in a few years' time, I don't think anybody will be doing the surgery from above. Thank the you. learning curve is long, but they are there. And they are challenging us. We challenge them, you cannot remove the tumor from below going to the optic canals. They say, we will do it. And they go to the cadaveric lab and they work on it and produce papers. In a few years' time, the whole neurosurgery will be in this comic. <clears throat> My series, till December 2018, I don't put the last two years. It's empirical because you need a good follow-up. 68 of tuberculum cellulae, 7 of diaphragma cellulae, mostly female, and large ones were 17. 
and this is the cases. I do not put a case without being uh, documented, well documented, because these will not, uh, you will not see them from far, so we'll show you in uh, bigger uh, scales. We do CT scan and we did the CT scan for our cases to see what's happening to the anterior clinoid. Here, anterior clinoid is infiltrated by the tumor. People used to call this hyperostosis. It is not. There is nothing in neurosurgery now hyperostosis. This is a tumor inside the anterior clinoid process. And you can see optic canal here is very clear. Here it is uh, deformed. You need to see whether the anterior clinoid are aerated or not because if you drill them, and you don't know that they are aerated, you'll cause CSF leak. You need to show whether the tumor is going into the uh, thymoid sinuses. You need to see whether the cilla is enlarged or not. Here, one case of mine where the tumor went into the sphenoid sinus. You need to know the vessels. Why? Because 20% are associated with severe bleeding. So you need to know what, are, what, what is this vessel and what am I going to do with this vessel and so on. So this is whole of the anterior communicating complex inside the tumor. Same here, same here. So don't say, oh, the, the vessel is inside the tumor so I cannot remove it, you can. So, but this is not a place for Speedy Gonzalez. So we'd go in, in two hours, three hours, taking a small specimen and send the patient for, radi for the surgery, for radiation. Do we need to care about differential diagnosis of these cases? I hope I will convince you that it is a must. Of course, supracellular meningiomas like these, but would you believe that this was a meningioma? This was a cellular supracellular meningioma. It looks very much like pituitary. So the main differential diagnosis is differentiate between meningiomas and pituitary tumors. How can you do that? You look at the epicenter of the lesion, and you look at the nodularity of the lesion. This is nodular, so meningioma. This is not nodular. And I hope people would stop speaking about figure of eight or snowman because this is really silly. Look at these tumors here, grain of meningiomas, though they look like both. Germinoma, this is a case of mine, histologically proven. Pilocytic astrocytoma, patient of mine, a young man, chordomas involving the cell and supracellular areas. I would not put a picture unless it is in my series, and if it is not, I would tell you. Supracellular plasmacytoma, patient from Iraq. Sacular aneurysm. Luckily, I did not come across any of these cases uh, because I'm careful, I do angiograms before. But look, if you are not careful and you open this, that would be the end of the patient on the table. Metastasis, again, would metastasis just hit the pituitary cellular area? Yes, they can. And look at this very, very unusual case of supracellular epidermoid masquerading like meningioma. Against all what we know of the radiology of supracellular epidermoid. And I think last time, Dr. Azm al-Hadidi spoke about these unusual epidermoids, and this is one of them. Immature teratomas. Langerhans cell histocytosis, a patient also from Iraq with this tumor that looks like a dorsum cell diaphragma cell meningioma. And this is my operative pictures. This is the optical carotid artery. This is the tumor. This is after excision. And this is histology. So this is histologically confirmed. Histocytic sarcoma it looks very much like a meningioma. And this Syrian girl. Opticasm glioma. Sarcoidosis. We forgot about these pathologies. They don't exist. Anything in the cell is pituitary, and we just sail through life. And lymphoma as a last resort. Azmi, do you want to comment? Please, come here. The, the most important three differentials for supracellular is the meningioma, 
pituitary macroadenoma and craniopharyngioma. These are the most common. Craniopharyngioma is the easiest one. Calcification, hemorrhage, uh, cystic component, two peak of age, young and old. We have the most difficult is the large macroadenoma and the meningioma. The macroadenoma, usually we have functioning and non-functioning. The functioning, you rely on the lab. You see what the lab result. On the non-functioning, it is the most difficult to differentiate from meningio. But now there is a promising research done on the nuclear medicine. There is a new paper now arising that's saying that FDG, the PET CT scans, the 18 FDG and the 13 nitrogen uh, ammonia. They are saying that the non-functioning has a high uptake of the FDG of the uh, 18 floor. While the uh, meningioma is high, having a high uptake on the 13 in ammonia. Well, this is a promising thing appearing now in the new paper. Thank you. So you're not convinced that this is important and you think you know everything? I'll show you this. This is from Johns Hopkins University, Baltimore, USA, and this was published in this journal, Pituitary Journal. There is something called Pituitary Journal. There's something called Pituitary Society. Neurosurgeon here, the, he does the spine, the shunt, and he plays with the brain, kills patients. There is a specialization here. Look at this. 57 patients in this period of time. One third of them was diagnosed as not meningioma. These were meningiomas, but one third were diagnosed otherwise. And this is where? In Johns Hopkins. What was the presentation of my cases? Visual is the main presentation, but epilepsy, headache, memory changes, and endocrine. Dr. Azmi told you about functioning or non-functioning. Sometimes the meningioma will give you high prolactin because they, they shift the stoke. So be aware of that. Of course, they can present with many others. We do investigate them from the vision-wise, the visual fees, the acuity, the fundoscopy, the uh, optic OCT, in full details before and after surgery. No one patient should go into surgery without this uh, pre-surgical assessment and post-operative assessment. What about my patients? The visual acuity was affected in one eye or both eyes, or it could be normal in 10. Visual feeds, this classical teaching that they have bitemporal hemanobia, wrong. You can have any of these unusual visual field changes. <clears throat> Surgery principles should be kept in mind. You retract the tumor away from the brain rather than retracting the brain to expose the tumor. It is not something that you want to separate them from. You take the blood supply of the tumor first, and the main blood supply usually comes from the posterior ethmoidal arteries. My surgical approaches, I use the interhemispheric approach in majority, but I use the other ones. And I did anterior clinidectomy in 42 patients. And this is the interhemispheric approach, bilateral coronal. And this is preserving the pericranial flap. And I cut the superior sagittal sinus in the most anterior part. I preserve the refractory tracts. Smell is important. Smell is not respected in this part of the world. We just want the patient to be alive. Hemiplegic, facial weakness, oculomotor, it doesn't matter. So here, in the olfactory tracts, these two hemispheres being separated. This is operative approach. And again here. And the anatomy that you see afterwards, when the tumor is really filling that, like in epidermoids, supracellular would give you this picture. This is the stool going to the diaphragma, and this is the basilar artery with its terminal branches. This is oculomotor going into the oculomotor triangle. This is what you aim to. You drill? Yes, I do. I drill the optic canals in most of the patients. And if the, if the tumor is going into the sphenoid sinus, I drill the sphenoid sinus. Here is the sphenoid sinus. Optic, optic, chaos, sphenoid sinus is open and I pack it. Follow-up is long. 
gross total resection was done in majority of patients. Did I have any mortality morbidity? Of course, I had mortality in one patient who came from Iraq and we had carotid rupture during surgery, which we could not control because the tumor was infiltrating the carotid artery. We thought it is pushing, it was actually going into the wall. Morbidity, of course, decreases smell, decreased vision, temporary DI, and so on. CSF leak and so on. Also endocrine, transit, transit DI, post-operative bleed, hydrocephalus, and so on. Did the visual outcome improve in all patients? No, improved in good number of them, unchanged in 15, and they got worse in two, one early and one late. Example, this is a preoperative. Left, right is completely blind, left is almost gone. And look at this after surgery, it opened up. Uh, here, a very good, nice paper from Japan about the effect of early optic canal and roofing. He shows you this picture saying, look at the optic nerve. And here, after removing the uh, anterior clinal process, you can see this strangulation of the optic nerve. This patient is not going to recover from the visual uh, problems. And I put this in one of my cases. Look at this groove in the junction between the optic nerve and chiasm caused by the tumor is here, pushing the chiasm against the anterior cerebral artery. And the anterior cerebral artery pushed itself into the substance of the optic apparatus, causing major problem. This is not going to improve. Let's go for illustrative cases and we'll finish. This is 28-year-old man from Yemen with this calcified supracellular meningioma. Uh, this is uh, supracellular before and after. Again, another one, preserving the stoke and the pituitary. Same thing. This. This is exactly tuberculum cell meningioma, no doubt about that. This old lady came with visual disturbances. This is before surgery and this is after surgery. Again here. The vessels are inside the tumor, but we could actually separate them. This lady from, uh, from Philippines, married to a Jordanian man with this tumor. We did surgery for her and we managed to preserve her functions and keep her well and alive. A lady from Iraq with this huge tumor before and after surgery. This lady from Libya, she was pregnant 36 weeks, and you could uh, argue that this is large, so we did cesarean section for her, and then we went for the tumor. And look what we found, this pituitary stalk being hypertrophied due to pregnancy. This lady, American lady, residing uh, in this area, and she put trust in us, and we operated upon her, and this is post-operative and long-term follow-up. Another lady, Jordanian Christian lady with this tumor before and after surgery. A lady from Iraq with this tumor. This lady from Saudi Arabia with this tumor that was going into the sphenoid sinus. So I went and the drill the sphenoid sinus, took the tumor from inside and packed it. Uh, again, this lady from Palestine with this tumor before and after surgery. We mentioned this lady. And this was a really dilemma. This man, Jordanian man, uh, had lost his right eye since childhood. This is artificial eye, you can see. And he came with decreased vision in this eye. So this was a challenge. He's depending on one eye and you have to do surgery and keep his vision in. That was really the challenge of my life. And look at this hump here. So you could not really reach the tumor. So it was really difficult. But we managed to do him. And he had one of the complications I mentioned to you. I was overzealous to drill this. And I opened into the sphenoid sinus. So he came back with free air inside the cranium with a picture of meningitis. Myself and Dr. Asad, we treated him. And he managed to survive well. 
And this lady, would you say this is meningioma? You would swear that this is pituitary tumor. This was a meningioma. And this lady from Iraq. Everything says pituitary. And prolactin was high. Post-operative, you can see the pituitary there. So it was pushed to the side. i uh, show you a couple of uh, uh, videos and we'll finish. This is the last thing. And we are very well within time. I chose this to show you that you can do this through terional. But that has a certain disadvantage, the terional. You are seeing the optic nerve and chiasm from an angle, and there are hidden angles, like the mirror of the car. Sometimes you don't see certain images because there is a hidden angle. And here we are opening the dura. I will just drop quickly. Here opening the sylvian fissure. How many of neurosurgeons certified to practice in this country know how to open the sylvian fissure? You ask yourself that question. So we have to open this. And then coming to the tumor, debulk it or take its blood supply first. Use the cousa to debulk it and then separate the tumor from the optic, taking the tumor away from the optic, keeping the arachnoid with the optic because of the blood supply. You don't stop until you remove the whole thing. So the tumor is out. No, you have to also take the dura it is attached to. So this is the dura here that you need to remove. And you may need to drill the canal. And this is the end of it. Okay, let's see the other one. So terional can be used, but look at the difference with the this is the lady I told you about. The tumor was going into the sphenoid sinus. Here I'm drilling the anterior clinoid process. I'm not touching, of course, the optic nerve. So I keep the drill in the bone of the anterior clinoid. And having done that, I open the optic canal. I take the tumor from inside because there is a tumor here going to the sphenoid sinus. So this is the tumor going into the optic canal. And the thing that will come in view now is the ophthalmic artery. You leave this tumor in and you'll have 100% recurrence. So this is the ophthalmic artery. You need to see it and you need to see it, you open the optic canal. So you drill both nerves, both uh, optic canals. You drill this phenoid, go into this phenoid, take the tumor from inside and then pack it. This is Simpson grade one. It's okay. And the last one. Again, here the interhemispheric approach. You can see olfactory tract here, olfactory tract here, optic nerve on the left, and you can see the anterior cerebral artery, A1, attached to it. Interhemispheric has been opened. You can see the branches. You can see the current artery of Hubner. You can come to the ACOM here. So you can see now A1, A1, ACOM. And you need to separate the tumor from these structures. Oh, the blood vessels were inside. So what? You should know this before surgery. And don't lie to people saying that uh, you are surprised. You did not, you are not surprised. You planned it like this. You planned to take a small piece and lie to the family and send the patient for radiotherapy. And this is the crime I'm talking about. Being patient, no place for speedy Gonzalez's who believe that they can do surgery within two hours. 
oh, he's a very quick surgeon, he's very good, he is lousy, damned neurosurgeon. So you can see now the optic chiasm. And removing the last bit of the tumor attached there. You can see the stoke here going to the fragment only. And we remove the tumor from within the optic canal. And then I remove the dura of the uh, of the tuberculum cellae. Because this is where the tumor is. Leaving there, it will come with uh, recurrence. Take two hours or take 10 hours, I don't care. I don't even look at the clock. There is something you need to do. Speedy Gonzalez says they look at the watch. Oh, I'm late. And the package is so and so, so I have to finish quickly so that I will gain so much money out of doing this surgery. So I think we'll stop here. We don't need to show, show the whole films. <coughs> and when we discharge patients, we give them detailed discharge summary, not the flimsy piece of paper that people do. Each and every patient must receive this. We respect ourselves, we respect our patients, and we give them detailed. So in conclusion, for me, transbasal subfrontal is an excellent approach for subracellular meningiomas, allowing full control over neurovascular structures. Visual outcome depends on how good you are and on the microsurgical techniques that you adopt. But this I finish and I thank you. <laughs> any questions, any comments? Floor is open, please. Dr. Farid Al Adham. Can you use the microscope? Uh, microscope. Microphone. How, how far into the surgery do you typically figure out if this is a meningioma or a pituitary adenoma? Or immediately. Something? Once immediately. I'm there, immediately, of course. There's so much difference between them. You can tell immediately that this is a meningioma. But most of the time, you have to know it before so that you plan your things. And the surgery will be different for uh, if we put a denoma, a pituitary denoma aside for the other supracellular lesions. Your Absolutely. surgery will be different. Absolutely. Meningioma is far, far more difficult than pituitary adenomas. And I'm always careful about carotid injury. So you have to have 8 0 or 9 0, 10 0 to be prepared and so on. And sometimes aneurysm clips should be ready. And the last thing to ask you, since you mentioned the aneurysms, most of the ophthalmic, uh, uh, very ophthalmic um, artery aneurysms that I've seen clipped, most of the time the surgeons will take the coronal approach and go to the, to the anterior clinoid and drill there and reach the root. Sure. So, what, so why do you think they almost never go interhemispheric or go? Lots of surgeons go interhemispheric. For but, that. Yes, but it's, you are good as what you are doing and you are good as your last case. You are as good as your last case. I learned that the bilateral subfrontal interhemispheric would allow you to go around the tumor from all sides. While terional, there are hidden angles. So I prefer to do this, but I'm not a prisoner of one approach. I have to master other approaches. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, comments, please. No. If you are just adrenaline the dura, you don't. Just excision the dura. If the bone is involved, you drill the bone. But if the dura is involved, you remove the dura, you don't reconstruct. It's very difficult. The main problem of endoscopy, as Mahmoud said, endoscopy is growing, but the major problem is CSF leak because you are going in to open the dura and have the CSF come down. So the major problem. Uh, reconstructed, but the percentages of patients with endoscopy coming with CSF leak and meningitis can, it was 60, 65 percent. Now they have reduced it to about 14, 15, 10 percent. But the learning curve is improving and they will come across this. I know of a lady in Athens working on just find the material to seal that uh, thing off. Yes. Okay, if not more questions, thank you very much. We'll see you. Uh, please.